Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a brand new episode of The Consulog. This is episode number 60 and your last episode for the year of 2018. I'm pretty excited about this being our year-end episode. We've had a lovely, lovely and fun year. We got a new host this year with Matthew Gerspin, always by my side. I it's always am nice always, to have somebody. I am always by your there. side, virtually. <laughs> Virtually by my side at all points in time. It's nice to have somebody to talk to, just not to myself. So hopefully you're also enjoying that as well. Uh, another bit of uh, showkeeping notes just to start you off with because I think people listen to this part of the podcast the most. So I get to tell you the things that are important to me. Uh, YouTube uploads are ending at the end of 2018. If you want to catch us, please catch us. Catch us outside. No, uh, catch us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. If we are not, or even on the website, like the MP3s are always on the website. You're welcome to stream us from there. But YouTube will not be an option. The production time taken to upload to YouTube was not a good investment of our resources. Just to confirm, so, is I, is the entire world stopping YouTube production, or is it just us? I mean, if it is us, that to me is the entire world. So as far as I'm concerned. And then we have some exciting news this week, Matthew. Yeah, we got our very first piece of fan mail. I'm, I'm counting it as fan mail, at least. So you may remember on episode 52, I was talking about my friend who uh, said that, my, uh, that it tickled him pink to hear that I was on the console log. You remember this, Harry? I remember being tickled, but not being pink. Yeah, so it tickled in pink, and we've been emailing back and forth. This is someone that I actually know, and one in one of his more recent emails, he, he said to me, I'm sorry I take so long, you can just pretend this came in through the USPS, to which I responded with my real address, and then he mailed me a handwritten letter, so now I have oh, wow. my first pen pal since, like, elementary school, and uh, the letter That's was amazing. hilarious. Unfortunately, I don't have it on That's me. That's so cool. Where but, is it? Yeah. It's, it's in my apartment, and right now I'm in my office. But anyway, Mime out there, thank you for, for, the, for the fan mail. I will respond in due time, and but you'll probably take forever to listen to this anyway, so we're good. Yeah, I will not give my address, but you're welcome to send me uh, virtual fan mail. Yeah, you're welcome uh, to send me fan mail on Twitter. I don't give out my address unless I've met you in real life. <laughs> Yeah, then that's just through a, through a post-it note that you get to have that stuck to your uh, 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 fridge. Uh, so we'll be back January 9th, so we're taking two weeks off, just so we can actually enjoy the holidays along with you. We're we'll be sorry to miss you, but until January 9th, we still have this episode to uh, talk about, so let's let's start talking. Let's start off this week's episode with a blast from the past. Bootstrap, everybody's favorite and most popular, I believe, used uh, UI and CSS framework. Bootstrap released a new version 3.4. Why does this matter? Because version 4.0 is already out. Why are we going back in time, you'd be asking? Why is Bootstrap releasing 3.4 when they've already moved on to 4.0? Well, the answer is that they're actually being an amazing netizen on the internet. They're actually doing a great mitzvah and actually taking into consideration all legacy users, uh, myself included, who are actually, they, we've been hurting for many months with a uh, cross-site security issue that was found in Bootstrap in the 3.x branch. And it's been a long-standing uh, uh, security vulnerability that was fixed in 4.0, but the upgrade to 4.0 isn't really an option on the table. So uh, Bootstrap listened to all the feedback from the community and actually released 3.4 to provide um, a safer Bootstrap implementation in 3.4. And that's just something you don't really see that much on the internet nowadays. Uh, it's, not it's many things have impressive. the scale. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I, I, not many things have the popularity of Bootstrap to actually require having to do this backwards patch, like Node does it, NPM does it, because they're huge, but not many libraries have to do that. So that's Certainly not very... many, like, front-end libraries. This is, this is practically a CSS framework, and they needed to do this. Yeah. Also, do you remember when it was Twitter Bootstrap? 
I know. I actually still search for that, and Google gets mad at me, and they're like, you mean Bootstrap, not Twitter Bootstrap. What is this? Yeah. What is this bullshit? I, I still like when job listings require that you know Bootstrap or say that it's a big plus, and it's just like, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, like any framework, if you know the API, you can fly on it. But most times you look at Bootstrap in use, it's usually been chopped up for the needs of that application. So <laughs> it's not really going to help that you know Bootstrap. You might have to know that company's version of Bootstrap. But uh, good on you, Bootstrap. That's that's just yeah. just not I'm seen in- a lot nowadays and so good. I'm impressed. Speaking of, uh, of updates, that is my segue here. <laughs> uh, V8 just got native support for public and private class fields. So this is really interesting. Babel just merged this a few weeks ago. We saw that coming. And now it's in V8. So you can play with private class fields in the native Chrome and NPM engine, which is super cool. So I don't know. Go go store things in your, in your classes. I mean, it makes the REPL even more fun. You don't have to install Babel to try to figure out what the heck these things do. You can just copy and paste in your console log <laughs> and uh, Wait, that's the name of the podcast. Oh, hey oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, V8's getting better. And uh, is that, that's in version uh, V8 7.2. Man, I think it was earlier this year that V8 was just 6.6. It's been a lovely year of growth for V8. Time flies, man. Uh yeah, so uh, I think last week or a few weeks ago, I talked about Flutter. Uh, Flutter is the framework that is being built by Google that enables you. It's a framework by Google that is written in the Dart programming language that allows you to essentially write native code with Dart, essentially Google's response to React Native. And this past week, the Flutter team announced Hummingbird, which is a lovely code name. I love that code name. Uh, definitely fits in with the Flutter motif. But Hummingbird is essentially the project to allow you to use Flutter on the web. Uh, so again, to make a comparison, uh, because I think in React a lot. So apologies if you are not a React user, but uh, React has. Please have a good there, reaction. So target. I will have the best reaction. I will hum the uh, reaction for all those to hear. But uh, React Native lets you write native code. There's a project called React Native Web that lets you write code written for React Native but have it run on the web. Uh, So you can kind of use the same code base for iOS, Android, and the web. And that's kind of what Hummingbird is doing here. It's letting you use your same Flutter code base and also have it run on the web. This is a blog post talking about the architecture they're using for this and what they're going to actually do to actually have this be done and the limitations that the web actually encompass, such as layout and CSS and figuring out how they're going to do these things. Uh, It's always fun to uh, have multiple implementations for the same end result, like React Native and now Hummingbird, but diversity breeds controversy, so let's all get down and get (laughs) rehearsy. I don't know what I just said. Yeah, that that, Uh, that one didn't work. (laughs) No, they usually don't. Also, uh, uh, diversity does not breed controversy. Controversy breeds diversity. I don't know. Those words just not go together at all. You're really just just, saying things, and you're really just trying to rhyme. (laughs) I have the time. (laughs) I got it. I finally got it. Uh, Speaking of what? I was just gonna say, tell us about the next thing. (laughs) Oh yeah, you're like shut up and get to the next item. Speaking of uh, using code, not (laughs) speaking of things written not for the web that work on the web. <laughs> uh, there's this framework called Phoenix. Phoenix is written in, uh, I believe it's Erlang? No, not Erlang. Yeah, Erlang. Phoenix is a framework for the Erlang programming language. And it's a server-side language, uh, Phoenix is. Uh, it's very good at concurrency. So if you have like a chat room or like a messaging app, Erlang and Phoenix is great for it just be due to how it actually is built. Uh, Phoenix is the framework that lets you kind of make a Erlang application very easily and efficiently. It's kind of like the rails for Erlang. And they've been working on this very awesome feature called Phoenix Live View. And essentially what it is, it's it lets you l- write uh, Erlang code. Actually, it's not Erlang, is it? It's uh, I'm going to double check myself before I wreck myself. Don't wreck yourself, Phoenix. Harry. Phoenix is hard to search for, but I found it right now. It's written in uh, Elixir. That's what it is. Uh, 
Elixir targets the Erlang VM. So like how Java targets the JVM, Scala targets the JVM, uh, Elixir targets the Erlang VM, whatever. Any case, uh, Phoenix Live View lets you write Elixir code that allows for uh, real-time apps. Essentially, it's kind of taking the benefits of front-end frameworks like Angular, Ember, React, and letting you keep your knowledge in the actual domain that you already have current knowledge of, uh, which is sweet. Like that's like it's it's very novel to see that. Uh, and they have this whole blog post about how it's in development. They're, they're writing about how they're doing it. How they're actually going to use um, web sockets. It looks like to actually handle this connectivity to say you're going to actually have a change in the UI, push that change through WebSockets to the back end and it returns back and forth. And that's actually where um, the Erlang VM works best is through just real-time updates. It actually, um, the Erlang VM, because it's so good, is because it uses the uh, actor method programming model, which is kind of what Redux is modeled after, where you send messages and you say, I want you to do this, and then it just knows what that means and knows how to behave. So that's why it's very good at concurrency. But I, I, I think this is very neat because it's novel. I've never seen this before. But uh, if you do write an Elixir application with Phoenix uh, or Phoenix application with Elixir, rather, uh, this might be a thing that would make your applications a little more rich and real time. Yeah. So the next thing that I am really excited about is React DevTools has a big update coming out. So there is a new feature inside of React on function components that I believe is called Override Props. And this will allow in the DevTools for users to change props on function components and native elements from within, uh, just from within the DevTools as opposed to um not so before you could only do this with class components and now you can inspect a react element in dev tools and update them and i personally write functional components all the time so i actually just thought my dev tools were broken until i found out that this was a missing feature so i for one am excited i mean in some ways i'm actually surprised about this because react always puts a great emphasis on the developer experience and this has been lagging for many months uh i'm not gonna point blame but it's just interesting to see this kind of lapse in experience here where they've added hooks to allow you to actually write stateful functional components, but the DevTools experience was far lagging that. And it's great to see it come to parity, and I imagine there's good reasons why it took this amount of time, but I will just chide gently from my peanut gallery. Yeah, I'm with you, man. Are you? Were you upset I, about all those times you couldn't modify your functional components? You know, I honestly just thought it was a bug. <laughs> like, I legitimately, well, like, I just thought something was wrong and, like, just didn't bother looking into it. Well, that's, like, a testament to the trust that the React team had built up that you thought it was your fault, not theirs. Or, rather, you thought it was an inadvertent issue, not a purpose, a, 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 a lacking omission, right? Right. Yeah. But, uh, it's there. It's good. Uh, it's a weird voice. So the last thing that we have until we get into uh, a little bit fun part segment of the episode is um, a long essay uh, by the fellow 3.1, which is an essay on the merits and advantages and just an elaboration on why you might consider CSS and JS. This past weekend on the Twittersphere, it seemed like people forgot that they'd like to hate on CSS, and everyone online was just raging about CSS. I just don't understand this I, pile Yeah, on. I didn't understand it either. People were just really mad about it. People got so much, like that anonymity online to be, and it's not even that anonymous online. People just like straight up just like are saying, you know, boo to CSS, and it's just not necessary it's not productive in any way yeah also but remember this... when we were talking about um what was it the the style tag how or the link tag how back then it just made perfect sense it's like a lot of the, like css is just like a thing that's been around a while yeah i mean it's god forbid we don't keep things around that already work i mean it's like you're not gonna buy a new pair of shoes because you got a black mark on your soul like, you know, like, you're not going to... Does that metaphor work? No? Maybe. Not I don't really. know. I don't know. Whatever. It's a shoelace joke. 
not really even. But this that essay was, was response. <laughs> I, I <laughs> have you ever heard of shoelace jokes before? I have not. They always get me tied in knots. They always get me tied in knots. <laughs> Harry, you are an enigma wrapped in a bearded Jewish man. <laughs> that is true. Um, but yeah, there's online uh, a question about like why CSS and JS and 3.1. Uh, was one of the first uh, implementers of a library for CSS and JS. He wrote Glamour, Glamorous. He, he's definitely thought about this problem for a long time. And because 280 characters is not enough to reply to somebody on Twitter, he wrote an entire gist about explaining his thinking about CSS and JS. Um, I need to re- re- reread the article, but uh, it, it, it provides a good case for why you might want to consider it. Um, I I I was also on the fence until I tried it. Uh, it's kind of one of those cases where don't knock it till you try it. And I tried it, and I got addicted hard to CSS and JS. Yeah, one of the um, uh, one of the first times I tried it was when I was putting together slides for my talk uh, on. So my talk is tomorrow for us, but this ships on Wednesday, so <laughs> it's yesterday. So anyway, I already I'm, saw the talk and enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll take it but, to the bank. It's okay. Thanks, buddy. You were in the middle of a thought. I'm waiting for you to talk. Oh, I did not finish. I My thoughts just trail off, man. They they don't know what's That's happening. Fine. That's fine. In any case, uh, if you are interested in CS and JS and you have some hesitations, I would uh, definitely encourage you to read this essay to have a better understanding about why, where, when, how, and uh, because for that thing. And uh, let's end this year's episode with a fun little year in review. Let's look back on this past year of 2018 that was, god damn was it a year. It was a like, big year. A lot of things happened. Just in tech and outside of tech. Just It was a big effing year. Yeah, let's... Uh, but we, I, look, just, we could talk about the things inside of tech or outside of tech. What do you prefer, Harry? I mean, let's just stay in tech because that's our specialty and let's not... Venture too far outside our comfort zone. Okay, fine. I, I was I was <laughs> mostly I was mostly going with which rock stars I got to meet this year, which I was very excited about. Oh, let's hear that list. Well, I I met Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day, which oh, I have yeah. been waiting literally my entire life, and by literally I mean about twenty years now, which is a good chunk of my life to to meet Billy Joe Armstrong and. We made some very awkward small talk, so I was glad that I got to do that. But I do have a picture with him now that is framed in on my apartment wall. There. Do you have a strong? Uh, do you have a strong handshake? Yeah, he had a. I don't. His, you... his arm was. His his arm was strong. <laughs> yes, his arm was strong. <laughs> I also got to dance on stage with Frank Turner, another one of my favorite musicians, which I will link to a video in the the bottom of this. Good. Because it is a great video of me on stage dancing. It is quite an amazing video. I will absolutely agree with that. (laughs) Harry Harry was forced to watch it several times after it happened. I was not. I didn't know what to expect, and that was not one of them. I was not expecting that. You you, you busted a move hard. It was great. I was very proud of it. I was the dance instructor for the crowd. You really (laughs) knew. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's, that's what case, Frank said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any case, let's let's talk about our highs and lows this past year of 2018 in terms of things that are newsworthy that happened in tech. Yeah, not First not not rock me, stars that Matthew met. I mean, you could talk about tech rock stars if you want to. But the first oh, thing I got I to meet to some of about, those too. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you're just full of all these uh, 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 meet and greets. It's good. Yeah, well, we went um, to React Rally together. That's true. React Rally was a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun with that. I, I encourage if you can go next year to go. It's one of the best conferences I've been to. That was when I learned that a everyone lot. has imposter syndrome, including imposters. Yeah, some people are just imposters, but. There, there's only a few of them. What do you call a uh, piece of ravioli in disguise? An impasta. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't plan that. I'm just my pun game is on point. <laughs> yeah, it is. The biggest one of the things that I was most excited about this year happened all the way back, I think, in January. It was um, uh, mobile Safari, the most popular mobile browser. 
finally, and I say that with so much emphasis, added support for service workers. Service workers being a low-level API to enable offline browsing experiences. And the lack of mobile Safari support up until that point was a big dent in just allowing it to be adopted more broadly across the JavaScript ecosystem. So having that happen in uh, iOS 11.3 was awesome. Yeah, that was really exciting. It's also like we've been hearing about the the dogma of service workers for almost five years now, has it been? So I don't believe it, it, is, eh? it doesn't really count unless it's supported on everything. So that that one was a big deal. Yeah, Apple is the kingmaker. It's really, really sad and impressive. <laughs> uh, also, the big thing was uh, NPM came out with a brand new website. Can you, that, that happened this year that NPM redid their entire website from start from from top to bottom. And it's surprising how much I didn't really use the NPM website until the redesign, where it became immensely more useful to me, which was great. Yeah. Um, another thing that was also big this past year was the introduction of uh, the GraphQL Foundation. And that's more important in the GraphQL world, but really what it was is moving the uh, onus of ownership of GraphQL from Facebook back to the community and pretty much setting up a future where GraphQL could be successful independent of anything else, which was just a great, great thing to see. Yeah, GraphQL is getting more and more popular every day. I I think next year it's going to really just hit its stride in terms of like production value. Yeah, one of my favorite news items this week, which, uh, good golly. This was probably this is... my favorite software release of the year. This is like this was my one of my favorite releases on par with like iOS twelve, and like that was <laughs> that was how excited I was about this particular release. So underscare or underscore whatever you want to call it, <laughs> <laughs> release it version one dot nine dot oh this year. They were on one dot eight dot three for like four years. Three years. Three, three years, years three, three years. years, and they just were completely unsupported. And then one day they just ship a version, and people just didn't know how to handle it. It was amazing. It was I had, for a long. Oh my god, I had a long time been so upset because there was functionality in Master that I wanted to use that hadn't yet been published. And all of a sudden, I was like, "Oh, great!" And then also in the change logs, they were like, "Oh, we have three years of improvements." It's like, "What are you talking about? You can't just like ship like a whole thing in a one point nine. Like, what are you doing?" <laughs> that that might as well have been two point I mean, there probably is a breaking yeah. change that no one knows about. Oh my god! I mean, I I, I imagine maybe the test suite passes, but still, oh god, Zooks. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe 2019 will be the year of Lodash 5.0. Oh, Lodash 5. Yeah, that's been a long time in development. Yeah, I I, I think uh, just not that I know JDD personally, but I from from his tweets, it seems like he's much more focused on it's ESM, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, and I don't really know of any other maintainers of Lodash, so. I think it's no, I think it's kind of up to him. Yeah. So, uh, JDD, if you're listening, here is a uh, call to you. I love Lodash so much. Please, please give us version five. I'll enjoy it. Give it to me, baby, one more time. Also, in the world of news, that I don't think anybody expected this news. No, I, I wasn't at all. I yeah, you know, when it happened, I was just like, yeah, okay. I didn't mind though. <laughs> I wasn't upset. <laughs> Uh, so we're talking about when Microsoft bought GitHub this year for $7.5 billion. I don't really care about the numbers. I more care about that change in ownership. That was just, I mean, outside the fact that GitHub was required, like, it makes sense that GitHub was acquired because I don't know if they were that profitable. And the amount of uh, VC money that had been pumped into to GitHub required something to happen, either IPO or, like, it, in all honesty, and thinking about this more, it actually is better that GitHub got acquired than went IPO. Yeah, I mean, an acquisition is not so bad. Like, going public means that a company starts to focus on very different things, you know, shareholders, whereas being yeah. acquired is just being acquired, so. There's also all this additional overhead you have to worry about, and I already felt like GitHub was already stretched thin, which is yeah. weird. Unrelated, by the way, back, also, to our, back to our previous subject, I was just browsing through the Lodash commit history, and it appears that they are very actively committing on it. The most recent commit oh, was six days ago, and seven days ago. Oh, good. And 12. Yeah, oh, there's, good. A, there's a lot of commits, so hopefully 
Hopefully we get... It'll be a uh, Christmas miracle. That it could be. Yeah. And also, uh, one of the last big releases of this year, which is so important to the JavaScript ecosystem at large, was the release of Babel 7. Long time in development, long time in beta, long time in RC. Uh, one of the most, I think, uneventful releases just due to the diligence and work that the entire team put into it. So, um, special call out to the Babel team, Henry Zhu, just fucking rocking that ish. Um, great yeah, release, love it. Really special call out to Henry. I, he. He worked so so hard to make this happen, and he like he he quit his job to make Babel happen. So just know, good good for him. Also, plug for Henry. He has a Patreon that you can donate to if you want to. Uh, just go to the the main Babel site and look into how to donate to them because they deserve your money. Yep. Sweet and uh, yeah, that was that was all the, the exciting things that happened this year. So is it time for our favorite segment of the episode? I, I think it is time for your favorite Matthew's segment. Matthew's jokes. Matthew's jokes. This is the time when Matthew tells jokes. What's on the platform today, Matthew? <laughs> 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 uh, I can't I even. So, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some tweets from the internet, and I'm going to be honest. I, I actually I, I could only find two tweets that I found interesting, so oh, I'm going to... Well, we had the third one with the imposter, so we're okay. Yeah, I, I figured I was just going to read that screenshot of you and me on Slack. So Her- Harry said to me, yeah, I used Angular 1X for two years and enjoyed it a lot. When Angular 2 came out, I was lost, and I said I was always a Backbone fan over Angular 1. And then Harry, for some reason, was like, I'd take Angular 1 over Backbone any day. I don't know what's up with that, but anyway... Yeah, I would. Then, Hell then we, yeah. then we went into some awesome puns, and I was like, "Well, maybe if you had a spine, you wouldn't feel that way." And Harry was like, "You're really angling for that joke." And then I said, "I stand up for what I believe in." I was proud of that. <sighs> Rough. And that is literally just a conversation we had. So other things <laughs> I found from Twitter, just like the one that we're having right now. <laughs> yeah, except except I did both parts. <laughs> <laughs> other other thing from Twitter uh, is a great one from Katya411. Uber needs to start showing pictures of drivers' cars rather than their their model name. Does it look like I know what a Nissan Sentra Expecto Patronum Excel Sheet 2008 is? <laughs> <laughs> another, another good one. This was from much earlier this year. This is one of my favorite tweets of the year. My five-year-old son just asked, what if we put a slice of turkey in the DVD player and it played a movie about the turkey's whole life? And none of the parenting books I've read have prepared me for this question. Gobble, gobble. So, Harry, be ready for when your son does that. Oh, dear. And that is your uh, episode of Console Log number 60, the end of 2018. Thank you so much for listening with us this year. It's been an absolute joy and blast. Hoping to try to get some uh, guests next year. We'll expand our horizon a little bit and try to see more things and get some more fun and expand what we do. But uh, thank you so much for being a listener. And uh, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your pets. Yeah, they thank, can listen as thank well. you so much for welcoming me onto the podcast, Harry, and, and our listeners. I thoroughly appreciate being here it's a, it's it's been a lot of fun it has been a lot of fun yeah and we'll uh hear from you again next year on january 9th until then happy holidays safe travels and may your console always be the brightest log in your fireplace bye bye <laughs>